Welcome to Investing in Intellectual Property with Dave. Man, we have some groundbreaking news that's fresh off the press. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Dave. I'm an intellectual property attorney uh, who deals with things, everything in intellectual property from trademarks to copyrights to patents in this new form of intellectual property that has just been on the forefront over the last few years, name, image, and likeness. I also played football at Michigan State University, as you can see, by the, 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 the jersey behind me here. So uh, this is a topic that is also near and dear to my heart uh, for many reasons. Uh, so today we have some groundbreaking news from the president of the NCAA that is now talking about potentially allowing the schools, the university to pay student athletes directly. So just to, just, just to, to show you how much of a, a seismic shift this is, I'm going to pull up an article of what the NCAA said back in. This was a, a letter that they sent back to, to schools in oh, March 1st of 2023. So earlier this year, NCAA sent this letter uh, to different colleges and universities throughout the country. And the, and, and, and the letter or the, yeah, the, the title NCAA sends letter to remind schools they cannot comp compensate athletes. So let's go down here. I'm going to just read the first paragraph. In the short email obtained by Sports Illustrated, the NCAA Executive Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, uh, let's see here, pretty much reminded universities that current rules prohibit a school from compensating athletes for NIL, including entities acting on behalf of the, of the institution. The memo also explains Presley stated that schools are prohibited from providing assets to entities engaged in NIL, such as prior priority points to stadium seating and access. So many believe that this was uh, this email was sent out to the universities based on Texas A&M, which had a, a arm of the university uh, essentially you know, raising funds to be able to pay the players. Now, they didn't call it an NIL a collective, but it still operated as such. And the fact that it was a part of the university uh, made it a big no-no. So again, the NCAA, again, just earlier this year in March said, hey, you guys cannot, the rules do not allow uh, schools to pay the athletes directly. And just kind of backing up even more to show you how all this stuff works, you have what is called an NIL collective, which is independent from the, the college or university in but however, this uh, collective raises money for a particular school. So again, I'm, I'm from Michigan State, so or I went to Michigan State, so I'll use Michigan State as an example. Michigan State has an NIL collective that's, again, separate from the university, however, and it's independent from the university, but the members or organization raises funds so that they can pay the student athletes, whether it's in football, basketball, track, hockey, so forth and so on. Now, again, the key word is this collective is independent or separate from the university. But in Texas A&M case, it was like an arm of the university. So it looked like it was a little bit more uh, connected or tied to the university, which was a big no-no. However, this, again, fresh off the press today, uh, the NCAA president literally just came out with a letter saying that you know, they're trying to propose some rules that allow the universities across the country to actually pay the players directly, which will be a groundbreaking of rule change so that not only it's a groundbreaking rule change for the athlete, because not only do does the, the athlete get a chance to get money from the collective and get money from whatever other businesses, uh, NIL deals that it can uh, barter with different businesses. It also get a chance to get paid directly from the university. Let, let, let me let's go to another article here. Uh, and this is a CBS article, which I think. Let me stop sharing here. Share this one. I think this is a this is from CBS, but I think it illustrates the point pretty good. So, again, NCAA president pr proposes creation of subdivision, allowing schools to directly compensate student athletes. This was, again, 36 minutes ago. So this is fresh off the press. And how mind, how quickly does things change? Earlier in March, they're sending a memo via email to university saying, hey, you guys can't pay schools. And now what? Uh, three, nine months later, they're proposing rule changes that allows schools to directly 
pay the athletes. This is crazy. Let's uh let's re let's read a couple paragraphs. I'm not gonna go over this whole article, but I think a few uh paragraphs will uh be sufficient to, to understand what's going on here. So NCAA president Charlie Baker, that's gonna be a name to remember, has proposed a revolutionary plan that could clear the way for schools to directly compensate athletes through an educational trust as well as name, image, and likeness deal. So you have this trust component, and then you have the NIL component. So the NIL component will work essentially how uh, things work now. But again, it goes through this collective as opposed to going through a collective. And I'm sure you can still maybe have this collective that's out there. Uh, the schools, such as, again, Michigan State University, the University of Michigan, Ohio State, will be able to pay players directly. They, be, they will be able to negotiate deals with the players directly and pay players directly. Whereas now, again, the collective has to do all that. Or the player or student athlete has to uh, deal with the collective and the university and its officials, employees cannot deal with the student athlete at all as it relates to money. And then you have the edu educational trust portion of it, which we will get into later. Again, the proposed proposal would include the creation of a new subdivision of Division One schools for football governance purposes. Okay, so membership in the new subdivision will be voluntary but will require an investment of at least 30000 per year into an educational trust fund for at least half of its total number of athletes. That will guarantee half of the school's athletes 120000 over four years of competition. And things are about to change. You're either going to get on this train or you're not. You're, you're going you're gonna to get left behind. But things are changing. And I think the NCAA, uh, shout out to Charlie what, Baker, because he saw things that are coming down the pipeline. With all this money being thrown around the student-athletes, with uh, student athletes changing schools left and right as a result of uh, really NIL, the, the, the opportunity to make bigger bags uh, with NIL deals at other schools, they're trying to get out in front of this thing. And uh, so whoever thinks that the student athletes and this NIL stuff is not here to stay, this stuff is changing. Who would have thought five years ago, heck, who would have thought one year ago that the NCAA would allow schools to pay athletes or at least propose changes to allow schools to play athletes? But Hey, yet here we are. So let's uh let's continue reading here. That so that that would guarantee half the student athletes 120,000 over four years of competition. Just think about this. Not only are you going to school for free because you're on scholarship, which is going to guarantee you housing, which is going to get, guarantee you an education, which is going to guarantee you food, but now you're going to college in over four years, really bare minimum, you're going to get $120,000. Because this again, this does not include. NIL deals that you can, uh, you know, you can negotiate on your own, whether it's a local business, whether it's with a Nike or whether it's with an Arna Armor or Apple, whoever the case may be. These are not including those deals. This $120,000 is just for what the school is going to be able to pay the athlete over his four years or her four years at that university. Let's continue reading here. Money distributed by the university will be subject to Title IX requirements, meaning half the Allocated money will be required to go to female athletes. Okay, so they're saying, hey, we're not going to allow just the men to be able to participate in this. The female athletes are also going to be able to participate in this, uh, this trust fund. In addition to base compensation delivered through a trust, schools could then sign additional NIL deals to augment compensation. So they're saying, hey, you're going to get this $120,000. That's just a trust component of it. The school is also going to still be able to provide you with NIL deals. So say, for example, you're going to Michigan State, for example, they have they're part of this voluntary a new subdivision membership in this voluntary uh, new subdivision. The student athletes is going to be able to get, or at least half of the student athletes, because unfortunately they're not saying all the student athletes at this university is going to be able to participate and get in this one hundred and twenty thousand dollars over this time period. You're there. This one hundred and twenty thousand dollars or this thirty thousand dollars a year is going to be uh, applicable. Or given to at least half of the athletes. So you would imagine that football players are going to get it. You're going to imagine that men's basketball players are going to get it. I would imagine that women's basketball players are going to get it. And I, I would think some of the other sports such as, uh, you know, women's softball and maybe men's baseball and some of the higher gross and revenue sports are going to be uh, available or permitted to get this money. But again, they're going to be able to get this $120,000 from the trust. And then whatever the school, the school can turn around and negotiate with each athlete to say, we're going to give you another $30,000. And again, that is not capped. So that $120,000 from the trust, that's only given to half of the student athletes. But then the school may 
turn around and give all of the athletes of the school 30,000 or maybe give the football players or basketball players a higher gross in revenue sports, 30,000 for each athlete. And then maybe the lower tier sports, maybe get like five or $10,000. So think of it. You can, as a football player, potentially make $120,000 a year with the trust. And then you may get another $120,000 a year just based on what the university is paying directly to the athletes as part of being able to provide NIL deals. Then you're still able to get money from negotiating other deals with local businesses, with uh, you know national brands. So again, this is going to be an opportunity for athletes to start making a bag. Let's continue reading here. Okay, the football-based subdivision will be independent of the FBS and FCS dictomy. Uh, teams at either level are eligible to opt into the football subdivision. However, teams that opt in will ultimately be able to exist at a different level than the rest of college football. So they're saying, hey, you don't got to opt in. But you're going to be at a significant disadvantage as it relates to recruiting if you don't opt in. So that's what it's saying. However, teams that opt in will ultimately be able to exist at a different level than the rest of college football. The group could decide different roster sizes, recruitment practices, transfer of NIL rules, even while competing against other members of FBS or F FCS uh, working under the existing rules. So they're saying, hey, you're going to be able to make your own rules as it relates to NIL, recruitment practices, and roster sizes. So it seems like it's giving a little bit more flexibility to the university to make some, to, you know, to, to put some rules and regulations in place as it relates to how that university is governing NIL and recruiting and things of that sort. Uh, do I want to read this? 30,000 signing a massive investment in athletics. I'm not going to read that. That's another one that I want. One more paragraph that I wanted to, uh, one more paragraph that I wanted to, uh, I think this is it. Okay, yeah, so additionally, the new proposal would allow athletes to be compensated directly from the schools without giving them employee status and protections, a key conflict among the NCAA and players activists. So you remember Northwest and all these other players try to say, hey, we are employees of the school and therefore we need to, who was it, uh, 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 you know, trying to unionize uh, you know, the sport, uh, football, or whatever the case may be, as being employees of the school. So the NCAA is saying, hey, this is going to allow us to keep things separate so that these uh, athletes are not employees, but it, it's, it's still going to be allowed them, uh, still going to allow the employees to be compensated from the school, which is key, uh, at least from the university perspective. So after the release, it seems like several ADs are uh, putting out public statements in support of uh, Baker's plan. Nebraska AD called the plan an important step forward. Ohio State athletic director, uh, one of the top leaders in the sport, wrote on Twitter. Uh, the Buckeyes boast one of the biggest eight athletic departments in the nation with approximately 1,000 athletes. The proposed plan would cost Ohio State University a mi minimum of $15 million per year. Uh, just to give you an example, based on Ohio State University participating in this plan, because again, they have to give 30000 The university have to give uh, 30000 for a membership. They're saying based on uh, the number of athletes that they have, they have to provide $15 million, but that's pennies to them. They're making two hundred and fifty million dollars in revenue. So, you know, that's 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 more potatoes. Let's see here. Thank you, Charlie Baker. See, again, Charlie Baker. Just to put things in perspective, he is newly hired. I think this is his first year being NCAA president. So, he's uh trying to get ahead of all this NIL stuff and these uh this portal, this transfer stuff. So, you know, I'm I'm not going to read the rest of this stuff. Uh, just coming back here to kind of further illustrate this point, which I think is going to be important. This NIL stuff uh, on a more serious topic is not only important because it's going to allow, again, just to be frank, most of these athletes are not going to the uh, professional, whether it's NFL, NBA, whatever the case may be. Uh, and unfortunately, this is going to be the most money that these athletes, a lot of them anyway, will make in their lifetime. So you're talking about 300, 500 grand uh, over their time at in college. That's a crazy amount of money. So for me as an intellectual property attorney, for me as a, kind of trying to put myself in a position of that athlete or as you know, you know, somebody that one of the athletes, athletes can look up to, I think it's going to be important for the athletes to, number one, make sure you are protecting your IP. Make sure you're getting trademarks on your logos and your branding so that you can not only take advantage of what the school is giving you from an NIL perspective, but you can also go make your own money because 
you have merchandise that you're selling, that you're signing autographs to, that is protected via trademarks, copyrights, whatever the case may be. And number two is make sure you are investing this money. Again, unfortunately, the unfortunate reality is this is the most money that a lot of these athletes is going to make in their life. Again, from a four-year standpoint, they may come out of this thing having made minimum half a million dollars. What are you going to do with that money so that as you continue to progress through life, you can make passive income on that money? Invest that money. Make sure to consider investing is a strong option. Parents, make sure you put that uh, investment bug into the athlete's ear and surround them with the right people if you don't know how to invest. You know, whether you invest in real estate, whether you invest in stocks, whether you invest in businesses, your business, somebody, someone else's business, it's going to be important to invest that money so that once your playing days are over with, you're still making hopefully $10,000, $15,000, maybe a month, or, you know, again, $100,000 plus a year based on something that you did back when you were in college. Let's face it. You don't have the responsibility as a student athlete that you're going to have once you have a family. And therefore, this is really a no brainer to invest uh, a decent sized portion of the NIL money, the money that you're going to see in college from, you know, again, playing your respective sport. So make sure you, you know, give strong, uh, a strong look at investing. And like I said before, make sure you are protecting any intellectual property that is almost mandatory that you have intellectual property at this point. You need to work with somebody who's going to provide, give you a brand, whether it's a beast mode, you got the you got the actual phrase, you got the uh, logo. It's almost a must that you are uh, branding yourself properly, protecting it, and, 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 and again, making some money off merchandise and things like that as you're in college. So yeah, hopefully you got something out of this video. Again, if this thing goes through, college sports will never be the same. We, we, might, we might just call this the uh, NFL 2 or NBA Part 2 or whatever you want to call it because these athletes who are already making a lot of money, man, it's going to get even crazier. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Leave a thumbs up. Uh, leave a comment if you did. Heck, if you didn't, still leave a, a comment. Tell me how much you didn't like it or what you didn't like about it. Until next time, I'm going to continue to follow this, continue to bring you the latest and greatest. Uh, peace.